Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Keeter. I am the host of the interview podcast, R-I-Y-L. I am extremely excited to be here with you today. Turns out that uh, even in the age of teleconferencing, it can be very difficult to get four people together on a live stream. Sometimes that live stream software doesn't work, but we will make it work anyway. Uh, I've been very much looking forward to this conversation for a few months now. Music writing is a subject that is both near and dear to my own heart. The and uh, we've got a really terrific cross-section of people from that world. All three of our guests are also accomplished musicians in their own right. Vashti Bunyan is the author of Wayward, Just Another Life to Live. The book is a memoir beginning with her early life and charting her journey by horse through the outer Hebrides. Did I get that right, Hebrides? All right, nailed, nailed it on my first shot off the west coast of Scotland. The adventure would inspire her 1970 masterpiece, Just Another Diamond Day. Vashti left her musical life behind for decades until the album was rediscovered by a new generation of musicians around the turn of the millennium. Howard Fishman is an eclectic musician who has released uh, about a dozen albums, including 2007's Basement Tapes Project, which features live recordings of the iconic bootleg record from Bob Dylan and the band. In 2014, he produced Connie's Piano Songs, recordings of music written by Elizabeth Connie Converse. The musician who disappeared in 1974 had her own musical renaissance in 2009, which she was unfortunately not around to see following the release of the compilation How Sad, How Lovely. Converse is also the subject of Howard's recently released book, To Anyone Who Ever Asks, The Life, Music, and Mystery of Connie Converse. And finally, I'm sorry I keep putting you at the end of my list, Ryan. I promise this is not a reflection on how I feel about you as a person or your music or book. Ryan Walsh is, a, is the founder and frontman of the Boston area indie band Hallelujah the Hills. The group has released nine albums, I think, depending exactly on how you count, including last year's deck. The project features 52 songs spread out over four records, one for every card in a playing deck. In 2018, Penguin published Astro Weeks, A Secret History of 1968. The book is a uh, detective story, I would say, built around the recording of Van Morrison's seminal masterpiece of the same title. Thanks, everyone, so much for taking time out of your Saturday to be here uh, I actually want to kick things off with Howard because your book is most fresh in my mind and probably everybody else's. Uh, I refer to Ryan's book as a detective story, and I think that's a label that can also be comfortably applied to your book as well. Can you start by taking us through that journey from hearing Connie for the first time to actually I, really thrusting yourself into this story and attempting to uncover that mystery? Uh the end result of all this was the book that has just been published 13 years after the first time I heard Connie Converse's music. And it is my attempt, um, sometimes successful, sometimes not, to understand and uncover the life of the very secretive, mysterious, and ultra-talented genius Connie Converse. Now, Ryan, similarly, at the beginning of the conversation, I also alluded to your book as a detective story. Um, really, I, I mean, I think in a, a very meaningful sense, Van Morrison's time in Boston is really more kind of a jumping off point. Uh, what are those central threads that you really started pulling in order to bring this book together? Well, you know, it all started with Astral Weeks and the, the magazine article about Van's time here leading up to recording it. And I was just shocked that there was, like like Howard, there was just almost nothing about this very important time period. And so when it came time to possibly expand it into a book, my editor said, well, maybe some other interesting things were happening in the city at that same time. And having grown up here my whole life in Boston, I was like, it can't be, it's so boring. <laughs> and within oh. you know a few months, <laughs> I had turned over all these rocks and I was like, there's a cult and there's this. <laughs> and so it's just like this kind of madhouse feeling of Boston 1968 emerged. And um, yeah, I mean, that like 
gee whiz, I'm discovering things, feeling in the book is real because I wrote it in the order you read it. And so, you know, the, 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 the reader is, is discovering with me. And um, that's another thing I loved about Howard's book as well. Thanks, that journey, yeah, you know, that journey you take us on. Yeah, Avashti, you're obviously a bit of an outlier, I think, in, in as far as the actual a- approach and, and the subject matter in that you are, mm-hmm. well, I suppose this is true to some extent of, of every book, but you are very much the, the main character of your own story. It's a memoir. Um, I, is there a sense in which there was a central mystery to be solved in your book as well, going back and revisiting this period of your life from several decades ago? Yes, in that I I started out ages ago trying to write this book and uh, making it, uh, trying to explain to my children (laughs) what their parents' early lives had been like, what the 60s had been like, how different they were to to their their own experiences. And I suppose the more I wrote about it, the more I realized how incredibly different it all was. And yes, I am an outlier here and that my book is about me (laughs) and uh, (laughs) Ryan's and Howard's books are about someone else. And uh, so, yeah, my my book is kind of different. Yeah, but again, I mean, there is a sense in which all of you are characters in in your own stories um and it really is for for howard and ryan it is really that that mystery that you're attempting to solve so Uh you you effectively inserted yourselves into the narrative was that a clear stylistic choice from effectively the beginning ryan um yeah i mean that, that i have a tendency to do at least little asides about w- what it was like getting the story usually if I'm telling the story to someone in a bar or something but um, a- again my editor Ed Park just found that stuff so compelling and actually like essential to the launching off point that he knew exactly how much we should include in there so well, that's good yeah I, ha- I had a lot taken out <laughs> oh, yeah. oh! Believe me, me too, me too. I kind of, I think maybe, I don't know about you, Vashti, but I, I kind of lost my mind. I think Howard alluded to it earlier, writing this book, and I was like, "No, it needs to be like a Noah's Ark of information. We got to put everything in." And my editor was like, uh-huh. "Or it could be a good book." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yours in particular, yeah. Ryan. Um, you know, I mean, uh, uh, obviously, Vashti has has a you know a clear chronological narrative and and I think to a certain extent Howard does as well but you were I feel like the most difficult part of the process of writing your book was figuring out which direction to go in I don't know about that I think we set a bunch of rules once we realized all of the things we had to pick from and uh I don't know I felt pretty mission driven it seems like a crazy quilt but like I know, I know where I wanted to go by the end, the end, the last page. You know, mm. uh, Vashti, I'm curious. Did you know, like, it's your life, it's your memoir. Did you know how it ended when you wrote sentence one? Uh, no, not until about a week before I finished it. <laughs> no, I had no yeah. idea how to finish it. I, I, it was that was the hardest part was knowing yeah. where to stop, and how much. How much to take out how much more to put in but yes the the end part was really hard for me you know how much yeah. more do i need to say oh no okay that'll do <laughs> it's quite it's quite did difficult you, to know did it surprise Sorry? you did you kind of did did it did anything about the process surprise you or did it unlock did you learn about yourself as cheesy as that might sound I don't think, no, I I have been asked that a few times. What did you learn by this process? What did you learn by remembering? Um, I don't think it has changed my opinion of myself, really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But uh, I didn't really rediscover 
anything because it's all in there it was all in there just waiting waiting to be to be said whereas you both of you had to do so much research I didn't have to do any it was all in there <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure that, my, well that's that's an interesting point I mean it yeah, it was this drawn entirely from your memory? Is there an extent to which you had to actually consult some of the people who were there? Uh, I only had to consult consult one person. Oh, no, two. Uh, I, I sent the, the first draft to a friend, uh, and she said, no, it wasn't like that at all, and so I had to change that. Uh, and then that made me think, oh, my goodness, what else have I remembered wrong? But actually, no, it was fine. And another person just didn't want me to say... Uh, uh, something about his dog <laughs> so um, yeah most of it most of it was just pure memory and I had nobody else has picked me up and said no it didn't happen like that <laughs> not yet <laughs> yeah I mean it, it, it is a sense in which it almost doesn't matter right I mean it's it's your story yeah. so you're telling exactly. it your way Exactly. Um, my sister-in-law said that to me when I was worried about how people were going to see it, if they would believe it, whatever, and then about all the other people in the story. And she said, it's your memories. Just get it down there and don't worry about it. And so that's what I did. Hmm. Howard, get, getting back again to this idea of, of a detective story of the, of the central mystery, is there is there an extent to which the mystery that you were going after changed? I mean, what, was it initially, let's, let's figure out exactly what happened to Connie? It was never, let's figure out what happened to her in terms of her disappearance. That was never the point of my book. And I think right. um, her disappearance, unfortunately, tends to overshadow the brilliance of her life and her music um, in ways that I hope will, will be mitigated now that the book is out and there's there's more there's more of her life available before the book was out most of what you knew is that she disappeared most of what everybody knew and now there's a lot more to know about her Howard, one thing i thought the book did brilliantly well you know i i couldn't like anybody i couldn't be helped but be attracted to that mystery like who vanishes and who would these incredible songs but you brought her to life so thoroughly that by the end, that mystery f meant so much less to me because you had given me an actual human and an actual life. And it was far bigger than that mystery. Thank yeah, you. It, was it was incredible. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it was never going to be a true crime book where I was going right. to try to track down the whole case. You know, um, it was about nothing else than the fact that I became completely overtaken by the the incredible um, talent of this woman and the genius of what she did and was unrecognized for in her life and the mission that I felt to draw attention to that and not the disappearance. <clears throat> How much do you think her disappearance figures and when you listen to her songs for the first time, if you have been introduced to her uh, as this woman who disappeared in 1974, do you think that makes people listen differently to her songs? I think the disappearance, um, yes. Uh, I, I think that the, it, we can't help but think that this is somebody who had a hard time fitting in and to mm -hmm. the point where she eventually ejected herself completely from society. So yeah. we can't help but try to read some of that, I think, into the, the music. Um, right. But the, yeah. the disappearance was not even, um, I mean, it's the final thing that she did, but she had a lifetime of making radical moves and surprising and confusing the people that knew her in the decisions that she made. Mm -hmm. Um, dropping out of Mount Holyoke College after only two years, even though she had a full ride scholarship, moving suddenly to New York, uh, and then 15 years later, leaving New York suddenly without any telling anyone why, and reinventing herself in Ann Arbor, yeah. Michigan, as a radical activist. Right. Uh... Yeah. Obviously, in, in that that writing process from earlier on, you, you're going on, in a lot of ways, effectively, 
nothing, right? I mean, there's there's right. not there, there's nothing in the way of really contemporary ports. Obviously, there there are some recordings. W- was there ever a point in the process when it felt like you had run up against a wall, or that it would be an impossible task to get an entire book out of the subject matter? Well, uh, there were many times through the course of writing this book where the trail ran cold in terms of certain kinds of information. And I, I admit that in the book. I mean, I don't try to gloss over that. And I, mm. in some ways, um, I say early on in the book something like, uh, Connie Converse's story is like a, a puzzle for which no, there's no puzzle box cover to go by to know what the final <laughs> right. looks like. You know, we only oh. have the pieces. We don't know what the whole thing is. So the book, in a lot of ways, is, is a presentation of the pieces. And it's, and it's given to the reader to share with me, like, here they are. What do you think? You know, that's sort of, there's sort of an implicit question, I think, in the book. Like, you know, I don't know what the whole puzzle looks like. Do you? Can you help me figure uh-uh. it out? <laughs> All right. Vachi, in terms of source material, we- did you keep a diary at the time? Were, were, did you have your own contemporary reports to go off of? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I had nothing, nothing at all, really. The songs, maybe, but no, I, I, I didn't write anything down. I have it all in, in the diary of my head, I guess. Um, and it, it was, it was quite easy in that way, and that I didn't have to keep checking things out. I didn't have anything to refer to, apart from what I remembered. But you know, my book is what two hundred and forty pages. Howard's is five hundred and something. Ryan's <laughs> is a whole lot more than mine. Maybe, maybe if I had asked more people, brought more people in, done more research, then maybe it would have been a bigger book. But it's just, it's just about me. So it's quite short. I say that's. That's pretty good for having a single source. <laughs> that, that, that being that being your your memory and your brain, I I I, I certainly would have been able to have written a a competent chronology of my life and at that point. I will say that uh, had you done that, I even things that no one has any interest in lying about. You know, I just found again and again and again people who were in the room experiencing the same event with no reason to lie had different memories of it so and there was no accounting for it and no explaining it so Uh i think you know you made a wise choice of just like (laughs) here's here's my version of the story that that, (laughs) yes yeah yeah. Yeah. how was your how was your relationship with your editor um ryan talked a little bit about his what what was that relationship like tricky I had four. <laughs> sort of, yeah, one of them gave up on me entirely. The next one oh, found no. it really, really hard. I think, I think because I was trying to speak in the language that I would have spoken when I was uh, a child, when I was a teenager, when I was growing up, when I was a musician, the the words that I used, the editor tried to change it into more current kind of language. And I objected to that. Uh, I wanted it to be what I would have said at that time and how I would have described things at that time. And so it was, we had a, a difficult time at first, but it, it smoothed out. Um, there are a few things that I objected to strongly, a few things that they objected to strongly. But in the end, yeah, compromise, I guess. But mostly, I think I won, and uh, I was quite, quite proud of that. That in the end, it came out as more or less uh, as the voice I wanted it to be. So, is there anything that got left on the cutting room floor that you regret in hindsight? Uh, not really. No, I think there are things I regret not putting in, um, but. Mostly, I think it was all there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I wouldn't have let them cut bits out, particularly. I would have cut them out myself, but I wouldn't have somebody else cut it out. I, I'm, you know, and, and that's the difference in writing songs or, or writing a book for publication that with my lyrics, nobody would ever question them or change them or edit them. 
but suddenly my words were being edited and that was a bit of a shock <laughs> but no, no one from the outside it. would edit them but obviously there's there's a tremendous amount of editing that needs to go into writing a song right lyrically in terms of you just don't you know you don't have two or three hundred pages to express these ideas yeah i sure don't my songs last about a minute and a half <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that brings me to a question I had written down for all, all of us. I was wondering if your song songwriting has been informed by writing, you know, nonfiction, or vice versa. Because I'll, I'll explain why I'm asking that. Because after I wrote the book, which was a narrative, I found, you know, lyrically I had been much more abstract before that, and I had this confidence like I could tell a story. I can get to A right. to Z. And the book gave me confidence to do that. And I and I thought that was so interesting for one medium to influence the other. And I was wondering if there was anything that you noticed, some kind of relationship between them. Are you asking me? Yeah. Uh, Howard, do you want to start? Asking Howard. 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 Or, yeah. Bo both of you. Howard, both of you. Howard, you take it and then, yeah. Sure. Um, I have been writing songs since the completion of the book. And... My song writing, um, for me, lyrics are, have always been quite difficult. The music is always pretty easy, and the lyrics are always a struggle and go through many, 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 many drafts. But um, my partner, while, during the writing of this book, um, a, a wonderful artist by the name of Sarah K. Williams, has encouraged me to write songs as if they were essays. Um, wow. Because that's the other thing I was doing while writing this book, is writing a lot of nonfiction essays. Mm -hmm. And she always said, why can't you, you know, when I would talk about my struggles with lyric writing, she would say, just write it like you're writing an essay. Why does it, why, why is that hard? Um, uh -huh. and she would hear me talk about my struggles with songwriting and, and I don't have struggles with, with essay writing. Hmm. Did you tell yeah. her because only you have a certain amount of syllables and <laughs> in the melody you've written? Because <laughs> it's not a prog rock album. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I like the idea very much. I don't know how to put it into practice yet. I haven't figured it out. Mm. All right. Well, for me, I haven't written a song since I wrote the book. It just, it just seems, uh, I don't know, maybe I've used up all my words. I don't know. But uh, But there were, you did have songs, Vashti, that, you, you know, had biographical elements. Mm -hmm. Did that yeah. remind? Well, yeah, go ahead. I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's a really good point. I mean, there, there is a way in which just another Diamond Day is effectively telling the same story that this memoir is. Yes, kind of. Yeah, it is. Mm. But it was, that was all looking forward. You know, it was all a dream. It was all a fantasy. It was all ahead of me. The, the stories that I was writing in, in just another Diamond Day. And the, the, then the, the next lot of songs I wrote, which were 35 years later, were kind of looking back, a lot of them a bit autobiographical, I guess. But then when I came to writing the book, it was, it was all so different, so different. And uh, I haven't gotten over it yet. I think yeah. to to be able to get back to to the way that I write songs is that they're so concise. They're, they you know I use maybe ten words where somebody else would use twenty, um, and I couldn't do that for for the book. Although actually, I probably did. I think that's probably why it's so short. I I I, I don't dwell on things. I'm curious what what that means to have not gotten over it not gotten over writing the book not yeah it, i mean it oh, sounds like you're oh. still you're still carrying it around and or maybe that's having an impact on your perhaps inability to write songs well carrying it around uh, as in the real world yeah going to literary festivals and reading it out and just having to carry a book with me rather than a guitar and all the other stuff for a live performance again very different very different and, and yeah, I, I, getting over it is, it's so different to putting yourself out there, the, the exposure, I guess, in a, of writing a memoir. And this, you can't get it back. Uh, so yeah, yeah. It, it does take a while to get over that feeling that you've d 
done it. I don't know how you feel, Howard, about having done it and it's now been actually put out into the world and there's nothing you can do about it. It's how it is. You're not going to be able to do any more editing or rewriting or rethinking. It's out there. Yeah, how do you it's feel not about like a that? Song where you can go out in concert and you know change a lyric you don't like or change yeah. the arrangement. Yeah, it's yeah. Done. yeah, it's done. Yeah. Howard, did did you have do you have any um, were there things you wanted to get in that you just couldn't quite nail down, or are there you know do you have any immediate like oh I wish uh, or do you are you completely satisfied with what landed? Oh, I don't I don't know that I'll ever be completely satisfied. But, um, <laughs> is is anybody? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do think it's possible that there could be things that come out about Connie Converse now that the book is out that yes. will oh. engender a revised edition, which I would be thrilled by. I would love to yeah. make new changes to it. Update yeah. it. Yeah. Right. I would, I would be right. very surprised if that did not happen. Me too. I, yeah. I, just, I just think it's going to, the, the mere existence of the book is, is opening attic doors, so exactly. to speak. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, it is. But also, I mean, you know, you, uh, Howard, you know, you, I think you bring up this point in the book as well, that she would, how, how old would she be? She would be like be 98 hundred and no oh, 98. Okay. So, so uh, just a lot of those people just aren't, they're not around anymore. And, and again, it's so much of it is really firsthand experience and so much of the process of writing this book and figuring out that you had a, a book worth of material was finding and figuring out who to talk to yes that's, that's true there yeah. was a lot of knocking on doors and a lot of cold calls and cold emails and um uh looking for needles and haystacks <laughs> the cold email is so much easier than the door knock often. or the phone call i think a lot of needles <laughs> and a lot of that's true, but a lot of these people because of their age didn't use yes them. You know, I remember when I had to reach out to Carmine uh, Deno Wassel Denoya, the gangster who was in charge of Van briefly. <laughs> he didn't have email. I called him and he answered the phone and he goes, hello, City Morgue. And I knew I had the whole guy. <laughs> and it, was, it was the only interview I conducted where I brought a friend along. <laughs> I was like, this guy's, he was in the mob. I don't know. He's an old man, but. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, Ryan uh, is. Sorry. Yeah. I was just going to ask if the if if that story is done as far as as you're concerned. Well, I mean, things happen after the you know the recording that's the holy grail of the book was leaked online by Van himself. It's a, this very hilarious oh, Serpentine oh. story. Yes, because oh. he wanted to preserve the copyright, so we put it on sale for two days on UK iTunes. Wow. But the way the internet works, it leaked. And so suddenly everyone could hear this thing I was writing about. It was terrible. I, I take no joy in being like, I've, I'm the only one who's heard this. I really wanted people to hear it, but you know, the way it came to me, I promised I would never do that. So suddenly, and you know, um, it was a real, it was a real thrill. And then, you know, on the other half of the book, the cult, uh, they tried to discredit me with penguin books. And there's been a lot of a lot of things happening in that camp as well. Um, so, yeah, the story continues. I would be how, open. How did they try to discredit you? What do you? What? I mean, can you? Talk well, about sure. Um, <laughs> you know, the book was thoroughly fact checked. My editor and I did due diligence, but then there was a lawyer at Penguin Books, and her <laughs> she her name was Karen. She was wonderful. She, and she oh she started the meeting. She said, "Now, Ryan." I'll, a dead person is a libel lawyer's best friend. So if I ask you if someone's alive and you say no, I'm going to look happy. But I'm not a ghoul. It just means we can't get sued for libel. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. um, you know, the oh. book was uh, the book was pretty airtight as far as factually. And, you know, um, and I tried to make a fair portrait of everyone in it. So but they they basically made a list of like 200 items. I think the title was something like. 200 lies and distortions Ryan Walsh told in Astral Weeks and sent it to the head, head of Penguin Books. And I was on the book tour in California, and my editor said, you know, hey, don't freak out, but here's this document, and you don't need to respond to every point, but look it over. And I, of course, responded to it. It was like, I was like, uh, you know, um, 
I was so mad uh, that they would do this. But with the, when I got into the complaints, I saw, oh, you know, there, there is still a cult mentality because mostly they were mad when I didn't talk about Mel as if he was God. <laughs> And so, you know, it was, it was close. Was that, was that one of the points? That... Yes. Yes. And for instance, like there's a point late in the book where I place Mel Lyman in a Dunkin' Donuts, which is hilarious to me after 300 pages of him saying he's God, he's yeah. God. Suddenly he's at a donkey's. It's, so, it's Boston. I mean, it's Boston. It so happens. In, in parentheses, I just wrote Dunkin' Donuts exclamation mark. And one of the complaints was, has the author never been in a Dunkin' Donuts? Why is he oh. shocked? about oh. you know just like oh. no sense of humor no you know yeah yeah but, yeah but i hope i i hope and expect howard that there's going to be um a lot of people perhaps who also knew her or who knows i mean i'm just very excited for you mm -hmm. and and her legacy yeah yeah, yeah me too yeah <laughs> I, i'm really curious and, and this is a question for everybody um you all answered it to some extent before, but in terms of actually getting to the point when you realize that this was going to be a book, how different was the end result from what you thought you were writing initially? For, for me, very different, very, very different. Um, I, I had, a, I had a, a picture, a visual picture of what I wanted it to look like and how I wanted the drawings and the photographs to be printed like. And when it came to it, it was because it was made throughout lockdown. I didn't get to be actually with any of the designers or, you know, everything was done by email and I found that really difficult. But uh, I, I well, the, the book that I ended up with was not like the one that had been in my head when I started out. Uh, it wasn't that it was a disappointment or anything like that it was just very different and I thought well because I'm such a control freak I wanted to be in charge of everything I wanted to see you know I wanted to I wanted the layout to be quite different and uh, somebody said oh well the way you want to lay it out just looks like a Microsoft document I said uh <laughs> is that bad <laughs> or the way you've got it laid out is how you'd write an email uh, is that bad? You know, it had to be the house style, and that, oh, that 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 yeah. didn't go down too well. So that's yeah, an interesting, it that's a really interesting like, answer. Oh, yeah, <laughs> because I, I haven't thought of I haven't thought of it in that context. Of you know, I mean, did all of you have some sort of idea of at least like a physical product? Yes, <laughs> I did. Howard. Yeah. Howard's nodding. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I even went so far to mock up my own version of what the cover might look like, which I was told, like, thank you very much. Please go away. Back to the words. <laughs> you know, stay away. Oh, you know, they, really? Um, oh. They're very protective, but, you know, because the cover is a marketing tool, essentially. And yeah. so uh, I was yeah. very pleased with how it ended up eventually. Um, yeah, I think that's it's a great. great. Cover, but, um, yeah. 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 I had to fight well, for but, this. I, I had to tell play. me about it. Yeah. Um, how, how so, Howard? They um, they wanted her playing guitar on the cover uh -huh. because they said, "Well, how's anybody? Gonna, why is anybody going to buy this book about this musician if they don't if they look at this picture of this woman smoking a cigarette?" Mm. Um, and I, I fought it, and I Good. I said she's more than, more than a musician, and also I want this picture, not any picture, this picture, and. They finally let me have it. Why did you? Good, can you tell good, me about good, why, good. though? About why this picture? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this photograph, um, to me, uh, sums up a lot about Connie Converse mm. because she's looking away from us. Mm -hmm. She's wrapped in her own world. It looks like she's in her own thoughts. And everything about the picture is so strange. Look at that lamp that's hanging sideways. <laughs> what is going yeah. on here? What is yeah. that thing on the couch? That, 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 right. Like, what is that dress that she's wearing? It, it's just a, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a series of very right. strange looking images uh, yeah. combined together. And it just sort of encapsulates her life to me in a lot of ways as this very mysterious uh -huh. figure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Sure. And somebody who is out of time in a way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now that yeah. you mention it, if it was that still frame of her on TV, you know that wouldn't that wouldn't evoke the the right feel, the vibe, no. the mystery. Uh, absolutely yeah. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Something mysterious about this picture that makes yeah. you want to know more, and that's the feeling that yeah. I always got from her music. I want to know more. Yeah. yeah. And, and and if it had been just her with a guitar. <laughs> And that would, people would think it's just about her as a musician, and that's you have written back. so much about <laughs> oh, her. That's oh, that's on the back. But if that had yeah. been on the front, then you know somebody picking it up I mean, for the first been time. A nice, nice cover too. But mm -hmm. to me, uh -huh. that would have been this is a music book, and it's yeah, in yeah. My mind is that's more right. than a music. Book. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Well done for holding out for that. It's, it's really yeah. great. Nice, really done. good. It's yeah. a success yeah. story. I don't think yeah everybody would have. Everybody can say that. Yeah, I, th I think it speaks to your, I, I guess, the dearth of source material that that Ryan can name a specific picture, and we all know what he's talking about. I mean, there's not a lot of uh, yeah. photographic evidence of this woman, and, and I mean, even yeah. more to the point, the the um, was it Cronkite? It was Cronkite, right? Yeah. The yeah, the, she she did a a television performance with with Walter Cronkite, and that's also just lost the time, as far as anyone knows. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, thinking of covers, the, the first uh, design that I was presented with was flowers, mushrooms, rabbits, and more flowers and leaves and pretty stuff. <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, so. I, I, I should say, like, having, having spoke spoken with you, that um, don't, don't refer to her as a folk musician. She does not like that. No. Oh, let's talk okay. about that. <laughs> I really oh, want to. I want to talk about that. Yeah, um, because people oh, talk about yes. covers as a folk musician too. So yeah, let's... Uh, yeah. I I loved that bit in your book where you were going through the genres of music and you came to folk and what you said about it. I yeah. wish I could remember it because yeah. I I only had a PDF and I couldn't copy it. I wanted to copy that whole bit out and print it and try to remember it because you. what you're saying about folk music is just what I feel about it and that and that the the, the word singer songwriter is just yeah <laughs> and of, of, it's just so i don't know so lazy i think when there's so much more to it and there was so much more to her uh and i loved what you wrote in that part of your book oh thank you so much yeah um, is it... sorry go ahead ryan is that the part where you're like you're talking about a folk song or a standard is it's a steak dinner. No, not a steak dinner. It's a, you know, you're describing the, um, this isn't ringing a bell. Never mind. Hold on. You oh, keep talking. Oh, oh, you're talking about, um, uh, the bit where I'm talking about standards and how it's like, a, yes, a, a, yes. a turkey dinner or a standard turkey dinner. dinner. Thank you. Oh, I love right. that part. Yeah. 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 Well. Uh, um, sorry, go ahead. Rashti. No, I'd finished. Don't worry. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I I just wanted to tell you how how much I really liked that yeah. part. Yeah, I mean Howard it, Howard on it, that it, note. It um, spoke to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, uh, obviously not a reading, but um, what, what's what's your what's your sort of pushback there as far as classifying her as a folk musician? Well, uh, first of all, the, the the pushback is twofold. One is that these genres um, are marketing tools and limit artists. Yes. And so let's just forget yes. about them, please. Um, right. But then, please. secondly, in, in 1950, a folk song in 1950 meant a song that had no author and no composer. It was a song that was handed around and changed from person to person. It wasn't written down. It was yeah. passed around. Um, so Connie Converse was not doing that. Connie Converse was writing no. songs. That, yeah, she that was a composer. Yeah. She yeah. was a composer. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And of course, uh, you know, everyone, they attempt to staple the new Bob Dylan <laughs> tag to literally everyone who picks up a guitar. Yeah, but um, my favorite yeah. dismantling of genre that I've recently read. I was reading Lester Bang's review of Metal Machine Music by Lou Reed, <laughs> and he, and there's a line in it oh, where he goes, right. he goes, it's all just folk music. 
(laughs) (laughs) And that's true. I mean, it's the biggest contain. It's it's such a crazy, meaningless, Mm. in a hilarious way. It encompasses everything. So how can it be helpful at all? Yeah, and I mean, one of the one of the unexpected joys of this whole thing, uh, in terms of the the nice exposure and the attention that my book has gotten so far, knock on wood, is that instead of calling people, instead of calling Connie Converse the new Bob Dylan, people oh. are realizing she was there before Bob Dylan. So Bob She's Dylan, the the old Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That haunted pre- me. In, yeah. is, sorry, Vashti, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the pre, the pre Bob Dylan. Pre Bob. Yeah, yeah, prehistoric Bob. Yeah. Well, the, the, the the fact that she left New York the month he arrived really yeah. freaked me out. I oh. I just the hair on the back of my neck stood up at that point. Um, right. Just the um, just the 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 timing of that is just wild. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, I I really I I really have the feeling. And maybe this is just my, I don't know, magical thinking, um, which I can engage in sometimes. But it feels to me like Connie Converse was imp- imp- like she had these superpowers, which were which involved being invisible. Like she moved mm. through her life almost as though people couldn't see her at all. Mm. Oh. And it, it, and the sad, the very sad thing is that. Uh, she had to disappear in order to be seen. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's, um, you know, again, I, I, I alluded to this at the top of the conversation, but a, a big part of the reason why I think having Vashti on the show really ties things together um, is there is this thing that you and Connie share, having had both of your work rediscovered, you know, decades after the fact. Obviously, uh, yeah. Vashti, unlike you, Connie wasn't there to enjoy that success. But no. but I, I've always been fascinated about this idea of artists being ahead of their time. Um, uh-huh. Is that an idea that you connected with at the moment, or is that something that you only really figure out on rediscovery? Yeah, I, I, I didn't know at the time. I didn't. I think... I don't know. I I don't like to compare myself with anybody really, but uh, you know the same thing happened to Nick Drake that he wasn't seen in his own time, mm-hmm. and like Connie, you know, we don't know where Connie is, but we know that Nick Drake isn't here anymore, and he can't appreciate or or, or be given the, the 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 love that he deserved back then. He he hasn't been here to take it and oh my goodness I don't know if Connie Converse would have wanted it in the way that Nick Drake did want it mm-hmm. uh, and I I just didn't think that I deserved it so you know it didn't I didn't think that it would ever happen for me I should interject real quickly that um, Vashi can very much speak on the subject of Nick Drake is the, the two of you were commissioned to actually work together at one point <laughs> Well, yes, Joe Boyd had this crazy idea that uh, he would send me to Nick Drake's house. I'd only met him a couple of times and, and we'd never spoken. Um, that uh, we could write a song together. I had a, a, a tiny baby. Uh, Nick Drake was sitting at his piano with his back to me. Uh, every time I picked up my guitar, my baby cried. And <laughs> it was never going to work. And. I have this wonderful image of Nick Drake's shoulders going higher and higher and higher. And I knew, <laughs> OK, this is uh, no way is this ever going to work. And I don't know why Joe ever thought it would, because we were both very shy, very uncommunicative people. And so, of course, we were not going to be able to write together, for goodness sake. But I have this wonderful memory of him, and I'm glad I do have that. But Vashti, there's a the leading up to the part in your book where you kind of go to the internet for the first time ever mm-hmm. and you know you learn some things um yeah in all those intervening years did you ever daydream about the life of uh your music might be experiencing you know outside of your perception no it no. never occurred to me i had left it behind so completely i had buried it wow 
completely. Wow. I didn't even sing to my kids. I, I had nothing to do with music for all of that time. And when I, and I, I really did think that it had disappeared. And it was yeah. Alta Vista. I don't know if you ever <laughs> were. Um, <laughs> yeah, before, <laughs> before Google, it was Alta Vista. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I put my name in as soon as I got onto the internet. Apparently, people do that, but I certainly did. And then up came all these references <laughs> to the music. And it was a real shock that, that mm. it was still out there. Without the internet, I would never have known. And I would never have done anything more. So, yeah, it was quite a moment. Howard, uh, if actually asked this question of Connie, but I, I got the sense that she really did want to be successful, that she really was uh, she, she really was seeking out that that sort of recognition. Do you think she was? I don't know that it was recognition that was her goal, but I do think that she wanted to be able to support herself through her work. Sure. Right. I mean, she didn't want to be a starving artist. Um, so I think that, yes, she wanted to have some degree of success just so she could live. Oh. I don't think she was expecting you know, to receive a ton of accolades and, and awards and whatnot, but, um, or to be yeah. a, a household name, but I think she wanted to be a professional artist for sure. Yeah. Well, maybe she needed uh, acknowledgement from her peers, from the people that she felt were ignoring her or, or, were, or didn't see her, the people who did find her invisible. Did she, do you think, really want to be recognized by her peers? Well, I think I'm, I'm guessing you would agree that I, part of the recipe that we need to feel happy or okay as artists is acknowledgement of what we're doing. Some, yeah. degree of, some degree of recognition that people get what we're doing. Yeah. And yeah. I, she didn't have yeah. that. She didn't have that. But then back then, how would you get it? You know, if, you, if the people around you didn't reckon on what you were doing, yeah. there was no other yeah. way. If there was no radio play, there was no TV. If you didn't do live performances, well, that's what happened with Nick Drake, that he didn't, mm. he wasn't yeah. seen. Yeah. yeah. I wonder, I mean, I wonder if there's another parallel here as well. You know, actually a big part of your story in those early days, you were, you were effectively being pushed to be the next Marian Faithful to, to the extent that your first single was a was a Rolling Stone song, and you know you were you were less than thrilled about that, and and you know and, and, and you wrote the B side, and I and I wonder, you know, I wonder if there's I wonder if there's a parallel there. I wonder if there's an extent to which Connie was going through something similar, although you know perhaps she didn't mm. really have that level of interest to drive her uh -huh. to really fundamentally change. Uh huh. Well, uh, you know, Andrew Oldham says now that he wasn't trying to mold me in, <laughs> into another Marianne Faithful, but the, the the press got a hold of that story, and that was the only story there was about me that he had chosen me to be the next Marianne. But you know, once it had taken root, <laughs> that was it. I was that. That's what I was presented as, and it I really I hated it. I hated it. But how different to, to Connie Converse, who was not actually presented to anybody in any way well, but, there, uh, there was, until you came along, Howard, until you came. <laughs> actually, it was well, it was David Garland who first first introduced me to Connie Converse. Right. And, yes, um, I, I'm grateful to him for that. We all are, for sure. Yeah, the, the uh -huh. string of people when something like this, uh, Phil Converse, her brother, preserved her music uh, digitally. Um, uh -huh. Jean Deitch, who recorded her in the 50s, brought one of her songs to his appearance on David Garland's show. David Garland oh, played it right, on yes. his show. And then yeah. a, a guy named Dan DeZula heard it while he was driving down the Jersey Turnpike, pulled his car over to the side of the road and wrote down the name Connie Converse, and then proceeded to uh, engineer the release of How Sad, How Lovely, which is her right. 1950s recording. Yeah. Um, but G just, to, just yeah. to go back to the uh, what we were just talking about, th there was 
there was no one to, for Connie Converse to be the next fill in the blank. There was, there was no one yeah. for her to model herself on because what she was mm -hmm. doing, um, it, it couldn't be marketed in any way that was, that was known at that time. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Gene, Gene's an interesting character. You know, I, I, I had actually interviewed him a, a few times. He passed fairly recently, but, uh, Incred incredible animator, like very, very pioneering, but he plays an interesting role in this story in that he is a, he is a champion of hers and, and he is recording her stuff and introducing her to friends, but, but he may have been one of the, the people there who was actually pushing her to change and that he wasn't really thrilled with her singing voice. He wasn't, he, he told me he thought she was not a good singer, which is a sad, really? yeah, sad uh... to hear. It was sad to hear when he told me that because Clearly, you know, many of us feel otherwise. But yes, he felt that um, what he said to me was, oh, if, if only we could have gotten a real singer to do her songs. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but that's, oh, I mean, that's, wow. you know, I, I, I understand that viewpoint in somebody saying that from the, at the time that he was saying that and, that and that there wasn't any reference for success outside of that. Well, there, there wasn't yet, um, you know, Bob Dylan hadn't come along, who showed that you could sing in an unvarnished voice that wasn't something you would hear that was pretty on the radio, and it could be immensely popular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Howard, yeah. Gene is, a, is someone in the book who eventually sort of pushes back on your inquiry. I was wondering, um, so obviously he didn't, he didn't get to read the book. He passed away in 2020. Um, were there, were there other people who were just like dead end? Like, I do not want to talk about this. Or how did you find most people like dying to talk about it? Had to be pried open a little bit or, you know, most people said, you want to talk about who? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, because they, they, either, <laughs> they either didn't remember her or they said, I didn't know she played music. Oh. oh, wow. Yeah. Um, there were some people that were a little bit more prickly, uh, like Gene Deitch, um, who didn't want to be bothered or felt that they had already told their version of the story enough and didn't, didn't need right. to do it with me. Um, but I would say for the most part, the people that I was able to track down, once they understood who this woman was and what she was doing, wanted to help. They wanted to help get her story told. Yeah, she. Well, I, you know, I, she went to. It was Ann Arbor, is that right? Yes. And, yeah. and she was actively. There, there was a point in her life where she. It's understandable that a lot of people in her life didn't know that she played music because she. I don't know if she was necessarily keeping it a secret, but she wasn't exactly playing it for those people. Well, she she left her music behind when she left New York. She she. As I said, oh, she uh, right. totally reinvented herself in Ann Arbor as a political thinker and a radical activist and spent all of her time doing that. And the people in Ann Arbor, for the most part, I would say 98% of them had no idea she had had this other life in New York as a musician. Wow, yeah. She kept it from me. But, but on the other mm -hmm. hand, you, you also reference several people who, when you say the name, start reciting the lyrics back to you you know, decades later, they still remembered them. Yes, those are yeah. people from who heard her in the 50s, who right. were in their late 80s when I talked to them. Right. And they said, oh my uh, God, Connie Converse, and they would start reciting lyrics for for songs they had no recordings of. Right, unreal. They heard uh, them since the 1950s. Like, how did, you know, how does this happen? How, how is it? Oh, oh wow. Well, right. It's only memories for 60 years. But they did. They that were. must have been amazing for you. That must have been quite Incredible. a moment for yeah, you. Yeah, that moment. Yeah. 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 Great. Were, were there were there people in her life who were surprised that she wasn't more successful? I know, as you said, her brother was a big champion and, and, and saved a lot of her stuff. But um, again, given that there wasn't really any context specifically for what she was doing, was anybody did anybody expect that she was going to go a lot further? I think the people that knew her in the 50s thought that when she got that television appearance with Walter Cronkite, that that was going to be it, that she was going to be the next big thing and that she was on her way. And so they were all quite surprised when that led to zilch, when it, it led nowhere. And she subsequently 
did an about face musically and started writing art songs after that. Excuse me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think there was some expectation among the people that knew her then that she was going to be super big, and then some real confusion that it, it didn't happen. Ryan, no. I, I want to turn your question on, on you um, as far as people who really didn't want to talk. I mean, obviously, knowing what I know about this book, there were probably several. Yeah, um, certainly. Yeah, it would pr crop up in, in the weirdest ways. You know, even even somebody like the the kind of mastermind behind the Boss Town Sound, that MGM marketing campaign, Alan Lorber, he wanted, he just, his, his first reply to me mentioned legal action. <laughs> and um you know just totally needlessly so I, I i truly think it was people were better off talking to me because when i talk to anybody it humanizes them and i want to treat everybody like a human a full human and so um but, but the big i mean van himself kind of features as a ghostly presence in the whole book and at first i was so disappointed he wasn't apparently not going to talk to me you know we were on twitter saying like i've talked to every living person who's worked on astral weeks at van morrison you know we just need to talk to you you know and uh everyone retweeting that as like a hail mary um but <laughs> at a certain point i realized like no wait a second um this is this this is actually helpful to the narrative because he's not the same person who made that album and the, his ghostly presence, mm -hmm. he, I should not talk to him. I, mm -hmm. He would have yelled at me. It would have gone poorly. And so, um, you know, oh. I think I, I, I have secondhand confirmation he's read it. But, you know, I uh, will say about six months after the book came out, he had a new album out. He hates to do interviews, but when an album is out, he has to do a few. And he did one on, um, I think it was BBC. And, you know, he's, it was a very strange thing. He said, I want to talk about fake news, fake news. I was like, wait, what's this? And he's like, oh. journalists, they just say anything they want. They make stuff up. And I'm like, okay. And then <sighs> instant pivot, he goes, and Astral Weeks. I wrote that when I was like 19. I didn't know I have to speak for it the rest of my life. You know, oh, or account for wow. it the rest of my life. And I, I, I felt, if anything, that was his review of the book, possibly. <laughs> well, Whoa. yeah, you're right. He has changed. And it, that, may, that may, I don't know, has that sullied the book for you at all? Like what's happened in the last couple of years? Uh, if you listeners don't know or anyone on the panel, Van has become sort of a anti-lockdown, vax skeptic, um, you know, really, really amping up his, his crankiness and... and um, and to a degree that I think hurts his legacy, which I find disappointing and needless, really. I think he thinks he's making a stand, but, but um, you know, no. I'd say I can put on Astral Weeks and just, it transcends. I mean, that was, the, that was what I loved most about the book, was realizing it wasn't one cranky genius's vision. It was this team of people accidentally colliding together and just making something beautiful and all these people deserve credit. And so I think of that, you know, menagerie of, of folks when I hear it. <laughs> menagerie. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. I mean that with, with just another diamond day, Vashti, that was collaboration actually might've been a, a, an issue for you ultimately. And that, that gets back to that idea of people, trying to put you into a box and trying to record that record as a folk record. Yeah. 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 Cause I'd been on the road. I didn't know who Fairport convention or the incredible string band were. I didn't know anything about what the music that Joe Boyd had put out or his witch season productions. I just didn't know. And so when he brought in, Robin Williamson from the Incredible String Band, and then people from Fairport Convention for some of the songs, not all. I, I was kind of taken aback because that wasn't how I saw the songs. Whereas Robert Kirby, who had uh, been, who, who wrote a lot of the arrangements for Nick Drake's songs, that was how I'd seen the album in my head was that it would be much more of a classical kind of feel than folky. 
Uh, and so again, I felt that I had been misrepresented, <laughs> not as a Marianne faithful, uh, but as a, uh, a, as a hippie, um, as a, a folky hippie. And what I've said in the book is that it was like Joe Boyd's portrait of me, how he thought of me. And when he turned the portrait around for me to see it, I didn't recognize myself. Right. And that was when I just said, okay, I'm done with this. I'm not going to do it again. And I didn't for 30 years, 35 mm. years, actually. It's mm. incredible, though, that, that you, you end it with a total reclamation. I mean, you produced your last album, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, it's so beautiful how you you turn that story completely around. I just, it's really inspiring. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was great to be able to to see, uh, to have a music program visually like, like a recording studio with all the, all the levers and the buttons and the, you know, when I was a, a kid uh, in the 60s recording, I wasn't allowed anywhere near the desk, right. yeah. this huge desk. <laughs> but to see it on a computer screen and be able to manipulate the sounds, that was just wonderful, wonderful pleasure. And yes, it was like reclaiming something for my young self. Yeah. Mm. On, on that on, on that note of production, Howard, the, the there was a record of, of piano songs that that you that you produced. Oh yeah. Um, and that that's a whole different way of telling somebody's story, and that's a way of really trying to to resurrect these things. It was that was it a difficult process, and and were you worried about your ability to be faithful to what? her initial intent was well she left behind these very detailed um composition uh sheet music uh, manuscripts of these art songs that she never recorded herself except for one there's one song she recorded called vanity of vanities which the first time i heard it scared the daylights out of me because it's so <laughs> creepy and weird and uncomfortable to listen to uh. but also so beautiful mm. so um when phil converse is uh her her brother offered to send me the sheet music. Um, I felt I had to do something with it. And I'm not a classical singer or a classical pianist. So um, I collaborated with the soprano Charlotte Mundy and the uh, pianist Christopher Goddard. And um, we made this album. And we just tried to do it straight, you know, um, as she intended, as uh, as per the instruction she gives on the manuscript pages. And, wow. Um, yes, it's, it's a completely different catalog of music. So it almost sounds like it's from a different composer altogether. Hmm. I, I, we, we can close on this because we're, we're actually about above an hour at this point. But the, um, you know, Vashi was speaking of, of Nick Drake. Obviously, Nick Drake looms really large and has a huge mythology. And I assume a big part of that is this for, for a similar reason that Connie does and that they're, they're just, they're not around anymore. And it's easier. It's easy to project some of that, that mystery. I know Ryan in your book, something that's, I, it's been several years since I read it, but something that's always stuck with me and that has actually come up in several interviews I've done subsequently are these stories about Van, effectively like channeling the lyrics i think he's like sta staying on a porch something and like you know the muse is mm -hmm. is delivering them to them is there is there a danger or i suppose is it is it not your any of your jobs even vashti's jobs as writers to to romanticize to to sort of give in to the mythology of the subject matter i i think I really believe you can have it both ways in, in a way because, um, you know, like the book contains more about the album Master Weeks than you'll find collected anywhere else. It really, you know, tries to get the nuts and bolts of, of what happened. But uh, it was one of my favorite reviews. I think it was in New York, in the New Yorker that said it just doesn't, it doesn't take away the mystery. And so mm -hmm. maybe that's just, maybe that's just, speaks to the power of how strong the music the art is but mm -hmm. i feel like um romanticized i don't know yeah i think i think there's 
trying to I'm trying to come with what I think of come to what I think of romanticizing things. Is that good or bad? I don't know. Um, but I don't know. It's just uh, as long as you're honest, I guess. Well, the, sure. the mystery is there in the same way that it is with Howard's book in that there, there's an absence at the center of the book in terms of the source material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was so yeah. – I mean, it's no surprise I just locked into Howard's book and just <laughs> – I, I, I felt a real kinship. How I knew what you were going through. You know, those those feelings where you're like, am I yeah. crazy? Or, you know, it was it was right. really rewarding to read. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as far as romanticizing goes, uh, I felt, well, part of the reason that I wrote my book was to defy the romanticizing that had been going on about my story. That I felt that it had been, you know, had been made into almost like a fairy story and it sure wasn't. So I had to be really careful also because for people who really loved that album, Just Another Diamond Day, I, I didn't want to spoil it uh, and take away too much from it. But but yes, honesty, I, I just had to find a way to balance it, I suppose, not to upset too many people. <laughs> I probably upset a few, um, uh, but also to, to make it true. For my kids, I wanted to tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. of it so we, and it wasn't terribly romantic <laughs> yeah. I don't think although I think other people might have found it romantic <laughs> but I, I, I think writing a, a horse through the English countryside it, 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 the, the, that's unavoidable oh boy <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know I know <laughs> It was raining a lot of the time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> don't try to don't try to downplay it. No, no, it, I, I'm I am proud of it. I am really. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think for me, uh, the the romanticizing was done before I wrote the book because mm. all anybody right. knew about Connie Converse or the story that was passed around Connie Converse is. Oh, this poor misunderstood woman, this lonely woman in New York who made her recordings in a kitchen in Greenwich Village. And then one day she got tired of being rejected and she drove away and disappeared. That was the romantic version of That's the kind right. of That's right. That's um, right. Yeah. And it's not true. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there are elements of it that are true. Yes, she made her recordings alone in her apartment. I've been in that apartment. I don't think it was in her kitchen. And it's not possible. Um, mm. I think uh, she had her own obstacles in her way. Um, it wasn't just rejection by the music industry. I think she um, she struggled in, in ways that may, may have um, prevented her from achieving the sort of recognition that she uh, might have gotten. And then um, she did not just get tired of music and drive away and disappear. She had this whole other life of doing yeah, very right. important things. Um, that's yeah. yeah, and there's no straight line between I'm not doing music anymore and I'm going to disappear. Like there's a big mm -hmm. thing in the middle there. Yeah, that's great. And also all yeah. the things that, that yeah. contributed to who she was before she got to New York, which was mm -hmm. pretty much unknown. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you bring up that last bit because I, I suspect that this is something that gets lost in the conversation, broadly speaking about the book, obviously historically speaking about her. Um, is is that work she uh, you know at the academic journal that her work is like still being cited to this day? I it's my belief that she will come to be recognized for what she was doing in the activist political world as as in in an important a way significant a way as what she was doing in music because what she was doing in in these other realms was just as radical and it just hasn't been recognized yet. I, I think. Connie Converse is going to be understood to be a major American figure, not just a major American musician. With, with a lot of help from you, oh, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> a bit before we go, can I just say how much I love the image of the filing cabinet? I yeah, just yeah. I, that really stays yeah. with me. That so... oh, yeah. it's like the two thousand one monolith in the story. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> yeah, right, really. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, 
this has been a really wonderful conversation. Um, hope everybody got as much out of it as I did. Uh, Vashti Bunyan's memoir, Wayward, Just Another Life to Live, is available now from White Rabbit. Howard Fishman's To Anyone Who Ever Asks, The Life, Music, and Mystery of Connie Converse is also available very recently from Dutton. And Ryan Walsh's Astro Weeks, A Cigarette History of 1968 is also out now from Penguin. Thanks, everybody, so much for joining us. Just another diamond day, just a blade of grass.